Welcome to this episode of Kung Fu Explained. We are continuing in the Shaolin Legacy series, and this is the fourth episode. The last episode focused on key events of the Tang Dynasty, including the endeavors of the monk Xuanzang and his travels to India, and how that became connected to the famous tale of Journey to the West, the Monkey King, and its representation in popular culture and martial arts. Now we will move forward in the timeline from the Song Dynasty onwards. While the Tang Dynasty was a high point of China's social, economic, cultural and political development, as time progressed it suffered the same fate as many such great empires. The empire started to crumble as a result of complacency in governing and internal struggles between military and imperial factions vying for political power. The Anlushan Rebellion, also known as the Anshu Rebellion, was a key incident in the start of the demise of the Tang Dynasty. This rebellion lasted from 756 to 763 and was started by a Tang military officer named An Lu Shan. He aimed to replace the Tang Dynasty with the Yan Dynasty. This marked the start of a period of conflict, death and chaos, which also resulted in famine and general suffering by the people. This weakened the Tang Dynasty's control over various regions and started a chain of such events which ultimately led to the fall of the empire. The years 860, 868 and 874 saw uprisings in the provinces of Zhejiang, Henan and Guangxi. This was then followed by the massive Huangchao Rebellion which took place from 874 to 884. Although the Tang government eventually quashed these rebellions, the damage done to their government was massive, and the Tang dynasty finally collapsed in 907, when Zhu Wen took the throne and established the later Liang dynasty. This was followed by a period of unrest, disunity and chaos, which lasted for the better part of five decades. In this period, the five dynasties rose, in the north, while in the south we saw the establishment of ten smaller kingdoms. From the mid-10th century, the northern Song dynasty took control of most of the former Tang territory. The northern Song was established by Zhao Kuangyin, who was a professional soldier in the year 960. During this time, the northwest was ruled by the Tangut Western Xia dynasty and the northeast was ruled by the Kitan Liao dynasty both being smaller empires. The Northern Song signed treaties with the Liao in the year 1005 and with the Western Xia in 1044 in order to prevent conflicts and promote peace between them. The Song Dynasty, incidentally, was the first government to nationally issue banknotes or paper money, and this was a result of a copper shortage at the time. They were also responsible for the further development and use of gunpowder-based weapons. The Song leadership took care to avoid the errors committed by the Tang dynasty. To this end, they ensured civilian control over the military. They placed financial, military and political bodies directly under the control of the imperial court. This was an endeavor to centralize power. The Song dynasty was a period of sophisticated administrative and social organization. During this period, some of the largest cities in the world were found in China, such as Kaifeng and Hangzhou, which held populations exceeding a million people. The Song government supported various forms of religion and philosophy, and these had a great effect on people's lives and daily activities. This saw Neo-Confucianism develop further and begin to include metaphysical aspects drawn from Buddhism and Taoism. Buddhist precepts were absorbed into Confucian virtues, and Taoism was used to explain inherent universal order. The Song Imperial Court also supported both Buddhism and Taoism. In the year 960, Emperor Zhao Kuangyin issued 8,000 ordination certificates to Buddhist candidates. Sponsored by the government, 157 monks were also sent to India to study Buddhism. It is said that more monks traveled from China to India during the Song Dynasty than the preceding Tang Dynasty. The Song government also set up a department specifically for the translation and printing of Buddhist texts. 
The emperors who succeeded Zhao Kuangyin continued their support of Buddhism. The dominant sect of Buddhism during this period was the Chan sect. Huineng's southern sect of Chan, through three centuries of development, became more aligned with Taoist and Confucian ideas. Of the five houses of southern Chan, the most popular were the Linji school and the Yunmen school and the Caodong school. Chan master Yi Xuan established the Lingji school in Hebei province at the Lingji monastery during the mid Tang dynasty. It is based on the doctrine of one mind. The school's master was known to employ harsh measures on his students, which included strategic shouting and beating, along with what seemed to be totally nonsensical answers to questions. The goal was to evoke direct understanding through experience, a sudden enlightenment through shock. The Yunmen school was established by Shi Wenyan, who founded the Yunmen monastery in Shaoguan in Guangdong province. His teachings were based on the three propositions of Yunmen. Shi Wenyan was known to use one word answers to his students' questions. This school was popular among the Song officials and Confucian scholars. It later declined and was absorbed into the Lingji school. The Caodong school was established by Shi Liangjie in Mount Xinfeng in Jiangxi province. This school was focused on the doctrine of the five ranks, which is in turn an analysis of the Buddhist doctrine of two truths, namely relative or common sense truth and ultimate or absolute truths. The ranks also describe stages of enlightenment. These five ranks included the relative within the absolute, the absolute within the relative, coming from within the absolute, arrival at mutual integration, and finally unity attained. Absolute refers to emptiness, essence, and principle. Relative refers to function, form, and being. Relative within absolute means that one is focusing on form. The absolute within the relative means that one is beginning to understand the principle behind form. Coming from within the absolute means that phenomena are a result of cause and reason. Arrival at mutual integration means that form integrates and coincides with principle. Unity attained refers to the full infusion of principle and being, of essence and function. It is the unity of absolute and relative, where one is neither defined nor undefined, a state of complete enlightenment. You can see clearly here that these concepts are reflected in martial arts practice. A beginner will only identify the physical actions and form of the techniques and focus on those. As they begin to deepen their practice, they start to identify the driving principles behind each technique. From there, they will begin to realize that intent is what makes each technique manifest as it does. And yet, later on, they begin to be able to manifest these principles and ideas into all their own actions. The great goal one strives for is to surpass the physical form and infuse the principles and intent into their entire being, manifesting as needed, when needed, naturally and constantly. From the mid-12th century, the Caodong school also implemented the practice of silent illumination or silent meditation. Chan Buddhism was favored by the ruling class and the Song court supported and encouraged it. By the 11th century, it was the dominant sect of Buddhism in China, with the Linji school being the most popular and the Caodong school being the second most popular. In this environment, it was from the late 11th century that the Shaolin Temple began to adopt the Caodong school of Chan Buddhism. The Caodong Chan master Yi Qing and his inheritor Dao Kai were invited to teach at the monastery. Shi Bao En, who was one of Yi Qing's disciples, joined the Shaolin Temple in 1089 for five years and further promoted the Caodong school there. During this period, the Shaolin Temple constructed two major temples within, namely that of the Temple of the First Patriarch commemorating Bodhidharma and the Temple of the Second Patriarch commemorating Hui Ke. These reinforced the Shaolin Temple status within the Buddhist world. In the year 1115, the Liao Empire was overthrown by a tribe called the Jurchen, 
who established the Jin Dynasty. The Jurchen were a nomadic tribe in northeast China. Wanyan Aguda united the Jurchen tribes and overthrew the Liao Empire in today's Jilin and Heilongjiang area. He named his empire Jin, which means gold. In 1125, they declared war against the Song Dynasty. They started their invasion from the north, capturing the area known as Yanjing, which is today's Beijing, and continued pressing south into Song territory. In 1125, the Jin sieged the Song capital of Kaifeng, which they captured in 1127. This was when the Song retreated to the south and established what is known as the Southern Song Dynasty in Xiangqiu. The central and northern parts of China by this point had fallen to the Jurchen Jin Dynasty. The Jin would continue to clash with the Southern Song for over a decade until the signing of the Treaty of Shaoxing in the year 1141. Through this treaty, the Song would hand over all territory north of the Huai River to the Jin and also execute the Song general, Yue Fei, in exchange for peace. Interestingly, one of the trends that grew throughout these long wars between the Song and the Jin is that of the development of lore of great heroes of resistance. The reality of the actual deeds of these heroes was less important than what later generations would make and inflate of them. The first of such men was in fact the famed general, Yue Fei. Yue Fei was a general in the Song army and he successfully repelled Jin attacks in 1133 and 1134. Yue Fei even deployed men with axes to hack at the horse's legs of the Jin Guizima, which were a very heavy cavalry unit comprising of male troopers linked together by chains. Horse leg cutting should be something most Chinese martial artists are familiar with. However, the reality of the method and the tools implemented are often lost in the myths subsequently created around this. In the year 1140, Yue Fei successfully counterattacked squadrons of Jin armies one after the other until he was in a position to retake Kaifeng. It was at this time that Qin Hui ordered him to stop and recalled him back to the Song capital. It seems that the Song took this opportunity of perceived weakness by the Jin to approach them and negotiate. The Jin demanded the execution of Yue Fei, as he alone continued to advocate in the Song court for the recapturing of their lands. The Song Emperor Gao Zong wrote a letter of gratitude to Yue Fei for his service, and then had him poisoned. In fact, the Song court was suspicious of military generals who wielded power. Throughout their conflict with the Jin, the Song court found themselves in a dilemma. On the one hand, they wished to curtail the influence and power of the military, while on the other hand, they relied on them now to defend and even recapture their lost lands. Yue Fei was a successful and effective military general, and he gained influence through his victories in the field, independent of the Song court. He was therefore seen as a potential threat to the Song emperor, as the military could become dangerously independent within the state under a leader such as Yue Fei. The fall and execution of Yue Fei is one example of the Song's court's attempt to limit the influence of military men within the court. However, the legend of Yue Fei only grew after his assassination. The fact that the Song was falling to the Jin, coupled with the success Yue Fei achieved in defending the empire and his sudden and seemingly treacherous assassination, only led to him being venerated even more by the people of the Song. His patriotic cry of Huan Wo He Shan, which literally means return my rivers and mountains, which simply means give me back my country, was repeated by Song loyalists during the later Mongol invasions of the Southern Song. The myth and lore surrounding UFA's life and actions grew over time and were repeated and built upon throughout the following generations. UFA's veneration even found its way into the creation lore of various styles of Chinese martial arts. Numerous styles of Chinese martial arts attribute their origins to Yue Fei. These include Eagle Claw, Xing Yichuan, Fan Zichuan, Chuo Jiao, and others. In some tales it is said that Yue Fei studied under a Shaolin monk, while others claim he studied in the Wudang Mountains 
and then went on to create his own bare hand style, which he taught to his soldiers, and this is why they were successful against the Jin armies. However, these styles, for the most part, can only be traced back to the Ming and Qing dynasties, hundreds of years after the passing of UFA. This further highlights how his lore had grown over the years. The timing of the formation of these arts is crucial to understand why they were linked to UFA. Towards the end of the Ming dynasty, China was once again being invaded, this time by the descendants of the Jurch and Jin, who were now called the Manchu. Attributing a style to a sage or a fantastical person was common in China. And as Yuefei had died while fighting the ancestors of the Manchus, attributing an art to him during this period of invasion and rule by the Manchus would add nationalistic and ethnic pride to an art. This was a way to increase the prestige and honor of an art. It is also common in Chinese culture to claim that something is older than it actually is, as veneration of ancestors and their superiority is a facet of Confucian thought. The connection of Yuefei to these martial arts systems is, well, a little hard to swallow. The reality of warfare during this time further discredits the idea that Yuefei and his soldiers would be involved in intricate systems of bare hand fighting. The Jin armies were heavily armored and well armed. They utilized heavy cavalry and mounted archers as well as a well-equipped infantry. As mentioned earlier, the Guaizu Ma was a heavy cavalry unit in which even the horses were armored. Heavy lamellar armor was utilized by the Jin army with cavalry units being referred to as Iron Buddhas or Iron Pagodas. These Iron Pagoda units acted as heavy dragoon shock cavalry units and they also often fought as dismounted heavy infantry. They were heavily armored from head to toe and utilized lances, bows and swords. It would be rather silly and completely illogical for a military general such as Yuefei to spend his time developing bare hand combat systems when facing an enemy such as this. At the same time, as covered in previous episodes, the Chinese military was also well equipped. The Song Dynasty was in many ways an intellectual golden age and scientific methods were applied even to the training of troops who engaged in physical education and regular drilling. Troops were tested for their specific functions and specialized groups were created for specific roles and tactics. Song Dynasty records also state that soldiers engaged in games of strength known as Jue Li or Xiangpu, which were wrestling types of games. Xiangpu contests are thought to be the precursor to what then developed into Japanese sumo. These were utilized mostly as a means of physical conditioning for the troops, as opposed to being actual focused tactics to be employed in combat. However, wrestling and control methods had a definite secondary function and utility in battle, particularly against armored soldiers. This is in stark contrast to striking with punching and kicking, which would be useless against such enemies. The Song Dynasty also employed gunpowder based weapons, which was surrounded in deliberate secrecy to avoid the enemy utilizing such technology. An example of this is the deployment of the fire lance by the Song infantry. We see this depicted on banners and war flags from the 10th century. However, it is only recorded in Song military manuals in the late 12th century with fanciful names such as the Pear Flower Spear or Li Hua Qiang. This weapon seems to have been a spear shaft combined with some type of pyrotechnic which shot out flames, smoke and sometimes projectiles. The main aim of such a weapon was to inflict psychological damage during battle to the steppe warriors and particularly to their horses which understandably would have been startled by the noise of gunpowder based weapons. Incidentally, the name Li Hua Qiang or Pear Flower Spear is very famous and common among spear practices in today's northern Chinese martial arts systems. And the name seems to be drawn from this older weapon. However, it features no pyrotechnics or direct connection to it at all anymore. The logical reality is that UFA was not involved with any type of bare-handed martial arts system. 
Neither would he have had the time to focus on this, nor would it have reaped any rewards in the wards of those days for him to implement such methods. However, we have seen that the Song dynasty placed emphasis on the regular drilling and preparation of troops. Yue Fei was an intelligent general who was known to have extremely well-disciplined and effective troops. This was most definitely a result of him preparing his troops thoroughly and he, along with other generals at the time, most definitely had his troops engage in regular line drills with weapons and applied tactics. This can be understood as a root of the later development of the Chinese martial arts systems we have today, even though this was not UFA's focus or intention at the time. In fact, Xing Yichuan is an art that is based on repetitive line drills of techniques as its core practice. It makes sense that in later times, retired soldiers who continued to maintain martial efficacy within civilian life would have this habit of practicing weapon line drills that they had learnt in the military. Naturally, this would then evolve into barehanded practices, as these are more useful within a civilian context where one does not walk around with an array of battlefield weapons on hand. A line is also known as a road or lu in Chinese. And as these would then later develop to include combinations of techniques executed in one line or road, and then differing roads would be connected into practice. Through this, routines would naturally and gradually emerge. A routine in Chinese is called tao lu, which literally means a set of roads, which accurately describes the essence of what they are and it sheds light on where they came from. With that, the military drilling of techniques is indeed the ancestor of today's martial arts. But this should not be misunderstood to state that today's martial arts systems were practiced by the military back then. The ideological root of these systems, combined with a habit of venerating ancient national heroes and their myth, is what has resulted in the connection of UFA to today's martial arts systems. This is not meant to be taken literally. However, orienting yourself to a higher goal and emulating the mostly exaggerated spirit of people of the past or even mythical figures has value for us as human beings. It makes us orient ourselves to a higher ideal and drives us to be better in everything we do. Following the Jin conquering the Northern Song, they gradually adopted the Han bureaucratic and legal system, and gradually they became progressively more sinicized. The Jurchen population assimilated with the Han population and adopted Han cultural norms and names, and also the Han language. Religion played a key role in this intercultural integration. While the Jurchen were predominantly followers of shamanism, the Jin court gradually promoted Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, and many Jurchen people, including both civilians and members of the upper ruling class, converted to Buddhism. In this environment, Buddhism continued to grow, and the Shaolin Temple flourished accordingly. The Cao Dong master, Shi Fa He, was invited to join Shaolin by the governor of Luoyang in the year 1140, and was also appointed as its abbot. Two years later, the Jin court summoned him to the Jin capital of Yanjing, which is known as Beijing today, to serve as the abbot of Puzhao Monastery, a position he held for nine years. Following his passing in 1157, Shaolin erected a pagoda in his honor. From 1145 to 1160, Shi Fa He's prime disciple, Shi Zhu Duan, served as the Shaolin Temple's abbot. Having these two serve, as abbots of the Shaolin Temple, cemented the Cao Dong school's prominence there. Throughout the course of the Jin Dynasty, the Linji school of Chan also had a presence at the Shaolin Temple. Shi Jiao Heng was appointed as the temple's abbot by the Jin government in 1209, and he served in this capacity until 1214. During this time, he promulgated the Linji teachings in the Mansung area. His disciple, Shi Hongxiang, succeeded him in this capacity 
in 1210. The Shaolin Temple was also highly influential in the promotion of the three teachings as one, or the unity of the three teachings, which refers to the complementary value of the Buddhist, Taoist and Confucian philosophies. In 1209, the Shaolin Temple erected a stele entitled Saints of the Three Teachings. It depicts the figures of the Taoist sage Lao Tzu, Shakyamuni Buddha and Confucius. And the inscription states, Long live the Emperor. Emperor Suzong of Tang praised. Confucius is the founder of Confucianism. His teacher is Lao Tzu, who is as mysterious as a dragon. Lao Tzu studied Buddha's teaching and achieved the status of Wu Wei. They bowed to the Buddha because they achieved the highest level of enlightenment. They are all our teachers. While praise is given to both Confucius and Lao Tzu in this inscription, you can clearly see the placement of Buddha above both of these. And in fact, it alludes to the idea that both Confucius and Lao Tzu's philosophies and achievements were a result of their study of the Buddhist teachings. All this in an address praising the emperor first and foremost. This highlights the underlying rationale for the steel and its erection by the Shaolin Temple, as well as its political savvy. That concludes this episode of Kung Fu Explained and the fourth episode of the Shaolin Legacy series. In the next episode, we will continue our journey with the rise of the Mongol Empire and the Yuan Dynasty. If you enjoyed this video, as well as my other endeavors, please do click like and subscribe. If you are able to, please support Mushin Martial Culture on Patreon. Patreon supporters have the ability to submit suggestions for upcoming episodes of Kung Fu Explained that may be covered. So, until next time, keep training everybody.